The story opens with our female protagonist, Ophelia, walking down the corridor as fireworks burst outside. She speaks aloud to the severed head she holds in her hand. She asks if he has any idea how much she suffered because of him. She then smirks with satisfaction, knowing he can't respond now. Ophelia has killed her husband. But to understand it all, we must go back in time, to the day it all began. Just one month after they got married, Ophelia's husband died. Because of his betrayal, which even she didn't know about, Ophelia is about to be executed under the pretext of guilt by association. Ophelia fled before they could capture her, finding refuge in a temple hidden deep within the forests. The place appeared abandoned, but unfortunately, the guards had tracked her there as well. Before she could react, they had already found her. Refusing to accept such a meaningless end, Ophelia pleaded with God to save her. Though she had no clear purpose in life, she knew she didn't want it to end like this. As Ophelia faced death, everything around her froze, and she heard a voice. It offered to turn back time in exchange for her lifespan. The voice explained that she was originally given 80 years, but she was about to die before reaching them. In return for rewinding time, it would take half of her lifespan, 40 years. If she were to die again after returning, it would turn back time once more, taking half of whatever remains. With those words, the voice faded away. Then Ophelia died. Before the cold sensation on her neck could fade, Ophelia had returned to the day of her wedding, a marriage that was against her will. If it weren't for this marriage, Isabella knew she wouldn't have died. She ran away in frustration but was punished by being confined in the mansion. In the end, Ophelia got caught up in the rebellion again and met her death, only to return to her wedding day once more. Now she had 20 years of her lifespan remaining. This time she made a plan and tried to escape, but all her plans ended in failure, leading to a forced marriage and then execution. With 10 years of lifespan remaining, Ophelia began her third life. But the sensation of dying never became familiar, and a new emotion took over her, rage. This emotion, which numbed all the reasons, was directed at her husband, who rebelled again and again in each life. So, Ophelia killed him. She thought she had finally gained freedom by doing this, but she was imprisoned for murder and faced her fourth death. Now, Ophelia only had five years of lifespan remaining. She felt hopeless, as killing her husband was also a failure. To be precise, she should not have killed him without reason. And so, in the next life, she started gathering evidence that her husband was planning a rebellion. Before he could be revealed as a traitor, she decided to be the one to report it to the emperor first. But while digging into his secrets, Ophelia was caught by her husband. After ending her life once again in the mansion's underground prison, Isabella has now reached her seventh life. Now, she had one year and three months of lifespan remaining. This time, Ophelia finally succeeded. Back in the present, a maid notices the severed head in the countess's hand and falls back in fear. Ophelia smiles and asks her to lend her the plate she was carrying. The scene switches to Ophelia making her way to the emperor's palace, where nobles had gathered. Ophelia politely greets his majesty and presents the traitor's head. Ophelia Fisia was born as the youngest daughter of an aristocratic family. Her mother passed away early, and her two older brothers acted like enemies, always eager to torment her every day. But her father regarded those two sons as the hope of the family. As for the daughter, she became the shining jewel of the Fisia family. Because of her father, who tried to sell her off, Ophelia became accustomed to the impure gazes of nobles even before her coming-of-age ceremony. She thought that her husband, Count Bordis, was also a pervert with a preference for young women. But on their wedding night, the Count confessed to Ophelia how the marriage was solely to gain control over the Fisia estate. He told her not to expect any affection like they were a real couple. The Count said this and left the room, then treated Ophelia as if she didn't exist from then on. Left alone, Ophelia was genuinely happy. The feeling of liberation from the family that tormented her made her think she would have a lifetime of sweet peace. That was all before the Count started a rebellion. The Emperor held a four-day banquet to honor Ophelia's contributions, but it was just a plausible excuse. The densely packed documents Ophelia presented to the Emperor exposed many families that had participated over a long period. That is why the Emperor imprisoned the nobles in front of him to root out those involved in the rebellion. So everyone must be watching their surroundings carefully. But it didn't matter to Ophelia. She was more focused on the delicacies in front of her. The nobles watched her with narrow eyes, wondering how calm she could remain after killing her husband. But to a person with one year and three months left to go, Ophelia thinks she might as well fill herself up with delicious food before she goes. But she gets interrupted as she hears the familiar voice of her father from behind. He smiles at her, mentioning that he heard she achieved something significant. 
He adds that it's the first time he's felt so proud of her, a sentiment echoed by her brothers. Ophelia glances at the jewel her father wears, suspecting it was acquired in exchange for betraying her. She forces a smile and tells her father and brothers that she was hoping to see them at the party today. Her father agrees, saying he'll come every time since they are family. Ophelia scoffs, reminding him that when he sold her out, he never said anything like that. But now he's making such claims. She remarks that while a person may lack money, they should at least possess some sense of shame. Then she hurls her glass of red wine onto his clothes. Before it can cause a fight among them, the emperor's subordinate rings the bell to grab everyone's attention. He reveals how the emperor has a message to convey. The emperor addresses Ophelia and asks her to come forward. The emperor acknowledges her efforts for the empire and expresses how proud he is of her. The rebellion that Count Bordas tried to incite was a grave crime that threatened the status of the empire. Thus, by the guilt of association, he orders those closely related to the Bordas family to be executed. However, he allows Ophelia to return to her life before her marriage is Ophelia Frisia. He also promises to elevate the Frisia family to a countship in recognition of her contributions. He then asks Ophelia to say what she desires. Ophelia confesses what she wants is freedom for herself. In the past, she had to marry at her father's command, but now she wants to think only for herself. Therefore, she expresses her gratitude towards his majesty. Just then, the emperor's advisors make their way to the throne room with the results of the investigation. According to the investigation results brought, no one knows how many heads will roll right now. The emperor's subordinate announces that the emperor has stated they can enjoy the rest of the banquet at their leisure. This prompts Ophelia to wonder if they're trying to sweep things under the rug for now. Nevertheless, she starts to leave. However, the emperor's advisors stop her. They explain that a large quantity of magical gemstones has been discovered on Count Bordas's estate. Since the gemstones were found deep within the territory with no signs of life, it's presumed that Count Bordas was unaware of their existence. When converted to gold, the total value amounts to approximately 3 billion gold. Ophelia's eyes widened in shock. Her own prize was just 5,000 gold. She begins to laugh ironically wondering if he wanted her to be buried in gold and die. It seems that in just one day, her status has skyrocketed, and she has become a wealthy woman. This news doesn't sit well with the other nobles. As they gossip, Count Habta observes Ophelia Frisia with quiet curiosity. He then approaches her and offers his greetings. Ophelia knows the Count is the owner of the Habta Trading Company, which had grown its business over the past few years and established itself as the best in the empire. The Count remarks that Philia is seemingly taking pleasure in shaming her husband and father. Australia apologizes, saying she merely executed a traitor who dared to commit treason. Her family sold her out to such a traitor. She says she understands that he looks at her in disfavor, but he should be more careful about what he says in front of the person involved. She reveals that while she was gathering evidence of treason, she saw something. The Count winces, and his voice turns weak. Ophelia smirks, saying the coarse meal she is going to present to the Emperor is not finished yet. She pats his chest, saying if he does not want to die, he should keep his mouth shut, and if something happens to her, the remaining documents will be sent directly to the Emperor. Nonetheless, the Count remains frozen in place. Seeing this, Ophelia smiles at him and encourages him to smile and not ruin the atmosphere. The Emperor granted Ophelia the Lordship of Bordas and appointed her as the head of the Fissi Count family. The day arrived when the richest person in the empire became a count. Due to the old servants being implicated in treason and being captured, all positions had to be replaced with new ones. It was an inevitable event. During the cycle of her repeated deaths, not a single person told Ophelia to run away. The maids praise Ophelia's beauty, who then thanks them. She tells them to step outside for a moment. Ophelia then slaps herself hard to assure herself this isn't a dream. The scene shifts to Ophelia making her way to the main hall. There, she meets with the crown prince, Ludov Zermak. Unlike the current emperor, who does not show himself, the heir to the throne directly interacts with the nobles to solidify his political position. However, he has a flaw in terms of personality. Ludov suggests Ophelia entrust the mind to the imperial family, as forces targeting the magic stone will surely try to harm her. Ophelia smiled as she expected this. After all, the crown prince is overly rigid and greedy. Ophelia appreciates his concern but says she will handle the rest. She politely mentions how patience is one of the virtues of a ruler. When the time comes, she says she will naturally disappear on her own. Her audaciousness confuses the prince, but Ophelia excuses herself then. 
Soon, her father approaches her to talk about the newly possessed mind she has. However, Ophelia walks past him as if he doesn't exist. Failure wonders how he could remain so unfazed. Then she was trapped in the darkness. Naively and foolishly, she believed in family ties. She often wondered if her father would come for her today, maybe tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow. Little did she know that even the slightest expectation and hope would limit her deeper into the mire. Now it's just a trivial emotion that has left no trace. The ceremony soon commences, and Ophelia steps forward. The emperor congratulates the birth of the new count of the Ermac Empire. Ophelia notices the seal, it's distinct from her father's and belongs solely to her. The emperor expresses his hope that she will become a great asset to the empire in the future. Ophelia thanks him and locks eyes with him. His icy blue gaze is the same as it was back then. Suddenly, the emperor grips Ophelia firmly and pulls her into the privacy screen. He coldly remarks that she has met God. Ophelia asks what he is talking about. The emperor says the aura flowing from her is proof. He grabs his wrist even more tightly, causing Ophelia to wince in pain. He smirks, telling her to stay by his side until he can be certain of this. Ophelia turns shocked and wonders if he is suggesting he will take her as a concubine. Wasn't he ready to execute her for treason under the law of collective punishment? Ophelia apologizes and smiles, saying she prefers young men. The emperor laughs and says she has a bold side. He says it will be fun watching her from now on. Later, back in her state of failure, she ponders over the events that happened. The aura that the emperor sensed from her. She wonders if it is really related to a god. She knew she should at least find out their name. There were now a few changes to Ophelia's routine. The emperor sent an aide for her, Sicarius Irondal. It's obvious she intends to keep an eye on her. Ophelia asks the aide if she knows where the nearest temple is. The aide reveals it is beyond the plaza and the territory, but it is about a two-hour walk. Upon asking, the aide reveals it is a temple of the Sidium faith. Ophelia knew it was the state religion, but there is no way a temple for the state religion would be this shabby. She inquires if there isn't a more secluded temple somehow. Ophelia explains it was dark back then, but it was a densely wooded area. When a while passed, the aide asked if there was a reason Ophelia needed to find that place. Ophelia says there is. Suddenly, fragments of memories came to her mind. She reveals how she made an important deal with someone at that temple. But both the temple and the person she made the deal with disappeared. Sicarius asks if she doesn't know the name of the person she made the deal with. Ophelia denies knowing anything about the place or the person. Ophelia knows Sicarius Irondal is a brilliant talent from the Royal Academy, and so she might have a way to solve the problem. Sicarius reveals that, according to her guess, Ophelia must have been scammed. She suggests heading back before it's too late. That night, Ophelia ponders over Sicarius's statement that she must have been scammed. She laughs but knows it's not a completely wrong statement. As Ophelia wanders around the mansion, she wonders if it is always this quiet. In the past, she was busy escaping from repeated deaths, but now she is properly facing this place, it was desolate. She wonders what she should do with her life now. She wanted to live so badly, but now that she has survived, she feels lost. As she leans across the balcony, Sicarius immediately pulls her back. Thinking it's because she got scammed, she assures Ophelia it is not her fault. Ophelia thanks her for her concern and asks where she has been. Sicarius reveals the crown prince has sent a partner request, saying he wants to attend the youngest princess's celebration with Ophelia. She says it's surprising since he has never been the first to apply before. Ophelia frowns in disgust and tells Sicarius to decline it. Sicarius is termed shocked and reminded Ophelia that becoming the crown prince's partner would mean being the most influential woman in the empire. Ophelia says if she goes, she will be the one going. Annoyed, she mumbles that whether it's the emperor or the crown prince, they won't leave her alone. She ponders holding a public recruitment for her husband. Sicarius' eyes widen in surprise as she worries about who might hear of this idea. The scene shifts to Ophelia getting bored. She asks Sicarius what she does when she is bored. Sicarius casually reveals how she reads a book, but Ophelia complains they are boring. Sicarius suggests she could look up and read something as a play. Ophelia points to a few books on Sicarius's desks, reading their names to be Taming the Duke of the North and Grace Wants to Fall in Love. Sicarius immediately hides them and protests that it is just a temporary loan. But she eventually gives in and gives them to Ophelia. Ophelia takes them and hurriedly leaves. Now that Sicarius thinks about it, she remembers that Taming the Duke of North is probably quite lewd, but she thinks it would be fine. On the other hand, Ophelia is flustered to discover a whole new fictional world. Engrossed, she reads Taming the Duke of North. Every time the Duke's body trembles, a clear sound rings from the bell hanging around his neck. Ophelia ends up reading the book all day long. 
Sicarius found her in the morning, but Ophelia was unusually quiet. After a moment, she finally speaks up, saying there's something she wants to do. For reasons she couldn't quite explain, Sicarius wasn't eager to hear it. Still, with little choice, she asks Ophelia what it is. With determination, Ophelia stands and declares her desire to endlessly crave and yearn for someone, unafraid of destruction or death. She confesses she wants to fall in love. Sicarius stares at the Countess, realizing the book she lent her had been for nothing. A few days later, a notice was posted in the county of Fisia publicly. It was a public recruitment for a husband for Countess Ophelia Fisia. The target was someone who knew how to love. As for the conditions, the individuals must be unmarried, and preference was to be given to those under 32 years of age. The deadline was the first day of November. After determining eligibility, three rounds of testing will be held starting from the 15th of November. As for the price, it was 1 billion gold. Soon enough, many men began to line up for the recruitment process. Pissed, Sicarius scolds Ophelia for offering a price of 1 billion gold for such a ridiculous competition. But Ophelia tells her not to dismiss her love as vain. She points to the line of applicants, saying many people want to marry her. Sicarius says they just want to marry 1 billion gold. Ophelia turns silent and then asks why she followed her all the way out here. Sicarius states she was curious about the husband's recruitment tournament candidates. Sicarius denies saying she came because she was worried Ophelia might cause some trouble. Sicarius sighed and asked what the first test would be. Ophelia enthusiastically reveals it will be a swordsmanship competition. To be her husband, they need to be physically strong. They will check these swordsmanship skills first. Next, they will hold a literature competition to see their delicate sensibilities. They also need to have the willingness to sacrifice anything for her. She gets interrupted by some commotion nearby. Ophelia and Sicarius notice a group of men harassing a man. Apparently, there were the psychics of one of the men declaring him to become the Count of Fessia. This confuses Ophelia, and she says she is the Count. Sicarius explains that typically a lord must be a male, and the man must believe that if he marries Ophelia, he will inherit the title of Count. Ophelia is pissed and says it is greedy, especially with the price of one billion gold attached. She trembles as a flood of realizations dawns on her mind. She says she doesn't like overly self-conscious people. She targeted the husband candidates with smiling and shy men. But that person looks like a drunken bum. She ordered Sicarius to remove that man from the list of applicants and hoped other participants would not like that. Sicarius suggests adding a personality test to the exam subjects. It might be good to include a general knowledge test as well. Ophelia agrees and appreciates her help. Sicarius casually mentions it is just to prevent strange people from coming to the Count's residence in advance. Ophelia chuckles, saying she expected her assistant to be fun. By evening, they are finished. Ophelia yawns, complaining she's exhausted from all the hard work. Sicarius points out that she barely did anything, so why is she so tired? Ophelia begins to protest but stops abruptly as a man bumps into her. Without so much as an apology, the man continues running. Ophelia watches as someone skillfully extends a foot in his path. The man stumbles, loses his balance, and crashes to the ground. A flicker of surprise crosses her face as she sees her wallet slip out of the man's grasp. The stranger who tripped him remarks that stealing isn't a good look. Ophelia, surprised, claims it as her wallet. The boy hands it back to her, and she thanks him. She then turns to the thief, asking how he knew she had a lot of money. The thief mutters that she's crazy. The stranger stomps on him to silence him, advising him to show some respect. Sicarius informs Ophelia that guards are coming this way. Ophelia remembers how they set up a temporary guard. When the matter settles down, the stranger suggests increasing the number of guards. He is stunned as he sees Ophelia and suggests she give him a token of gratitude. Ophelia says she is going to give him her wallet as a reward, but he refuses to take it. This makes her wonder what kind of gratitude does he want. Her heart pounds wildly as she stares at the man before her. Without a word, he wets his finger and gently brushes it across her forehead. Ophelia's eyes widen in shock as an unexpected vision flashes before her, a dense forest, wild and ancient, as though calling her name. The image is vivid yet fleeting, and just as quickly, she's pulled back to reality. She stumbles back, demanding to know what he's doing. The man looks startled himself, murmuring in disbelief before chuckling. He explains that this was a custom in his village, an old way to recognize someone familiar. He admits he was just trying to see if she might be someone he once knew. But Ophelia's suspicion lingers, the vision she saw felt too real, too familiar. Her mind races as she wonders what that forest is and why it feels like a lost memory. 
The man notices her hesitation, offering an apology for his odd behavior and turning to leave. Before he can go, Ophelia stops him, urgently asking if they have met before. The man raises a brow, smirking as he recalls similar encounters in the past, asking if this tactic is still frequent practice nowadays. Frustrated, Ophelia insists he answers her directly. With a sigh, he says it's been many years since he last set foot here, making it unlikely they have ever crossed paths. When she asks how long exactly, he only remarks that it's been so long that he's sure they haven't met. Ophelia finally lets go of his hand, watching him carefully. He mentions he's here for a particular competition, and a spark of realization dawns on her face. He must mean the husband selection contest. Sicarius asks if they should pick that man right away if he shows up on the list. Ophelia turns perplexed and refuses assertively. Sicarius comments that she was looking at him like she'd fallen at first sight. Ophelia scoffs and disagrees. Even though it was the first time she saw him today, it felt like reuniting with someone she hadn't seen in ages. And the filler knew this strange feeling in her chest was not love. She ordered Sicarius to find out more about the man for her. Securus notes down in her diary the man's description. Ophelia also asks her to post a recruitment notice for knights in the territory with a monthly salary of 40 gold. Sicarius reminds the Countess that knights usually earn around 20 gold per month. Ophelia says she knows that. That is why she wants to offer double so they will work twice as hard. Sicarius remains quiet, unable to believe the villagers said that. Ophelia is aware that forming a private light order is technically illegal under imperial law. But if one appoints a light sent by the imperial family as captain, they can establish legally their own order. But Ophelia has never liked anything about the imperial family. She gets cut off from her thoughts as Sicarius enters and informs her how she has posted the night recruitment notice as she requested. Plus, the night sent from the Imperial capital has already arrived. Ophelia asks who it is. Sicarius reveals it is the second son of the Pendelium Marquisate, Cadden de Pendelium. Apparently, he is the youngest person to ever pass the night exam, and he even won the Imperial Swordsmanship Tournament, where His Majesty personally presented him with a sword. Moreover, he was the second knight commander of the Imperial Order, but recently he was excommunicated and assigned here. Ophelia asks what happened. Sicarius reveals that before the death of the former Count Bordas, the last person he met in the capital was the Marquis of Pendelium. However, there is no evidence of them conspiring in the rebellion. As Sicarius said, the Pendelium Marquis was not involved in the rebellion. But just because he met with Count Bordas, his son was demoted from knight commander and excommunicated. Ophelia tells her to bring him in for now. Ophelia finally meets with Sir Cadden and exchanges greetings. Ophelia could tell he seemed displeased somehow. She wonders if it is because he was sent down to what was once Bordas territory. If only his father had not met with the Count, his future would have been bright. Ophelia thanks Cadden for traveling such a long distance, saying she is delighted to meet him in person. Cadden says he saw a rather shocking public notice on the way here. He asks her if she really put out this notice. Ophelia notices the night recruitment notice she posted on the table. She agrees, saying it has her official seal. Cadden confesses that seeing the scene now understands how she perceives knights. This confuses Ophelia, and she asks what exactly he means by that. Cadden explains that a knight's loyalty is sacred. It stems from a genuine devotion to their lord and can't be purchased with money. Ophelia chuckles and says she never asked anyone to swear loyalty to her. Phileas says she is a woman who killed her husband and turned her back on her family, a woman who would not be punished enough even if killed. She is a wretched widow who, despite it all, became ridiculously rich overnight, and a mad woman holding a contest to find a new husband. That is what people say about her. So, she asks Cadden who would ever want to pledge their loyalty to someone like her. And from the very start, she affirms that she has made it clear she is looking for knights to work for her and wants a clean contractual relationship. Nonetheless, if she were to go by Cadden's standards, the loyalty would be to money and not to her. Cadden asks who in their right mind would say that. Ophelia smiles and explains that, between her and the money, objectively, money holds more value. Ophelia is aware that Cadden has lived his whole life with upright principles, so this kind of conversation might be foreign to him. That is precisely why he is a talent worth keeping. She explains to Cadden how incidents keep happening in the territory as she doesn't have a knight's order. She says it is fine if there are no knights to follow her, but not having rights for the people is a sad affair. That is why she needs the knight's order and someone capable of leading it. She promises to ensure clearing the Pendelium family name of any involvement in the rebellion if he becomes the captain of the order. This perks up Cadden's attention. He asked what if he refused, to which Ophelia pondered. 
she smiles, saying she can't do anything if he refuses and will just wait for the next suitable night. With that, Cadden accepts her request and promises to serve her diligently if she entrusts him with their position of captain. This makes Ophelia happy, and she holds his hand, promising to pay him more than 80 gold for his salary. Cadden retracts his hand, saying he did not accept this role for the money. Ophelia agrees but says a captain can't be paid the same as his knights. She comments that it is good to see he doesn't seem to dislike her personally. Cadden asks, what does she mean? Ophelia says he criticized her actions but didn't denounce her existence. The scene shifts to Ophelia discussing contract matters with Sicarius. She is contemplating a contract for one year and two months. Sicarius says they can consider that as an adjustment and renew under better conditions afterward. She asks why, specifically one year and two months, though. Ophelia pauses for a moment. She then asks Sicarius how long she would be working here. Sicarius answers that an aide serves the Lord for life unless dismissed. Someone who knows their estate well wouldn't be sent elsewhere in the first place. It is difficult to get a good evaluation if an aide switches jobs, but if there is a letter of recommendation, that's something else. Ophelia perks up, saying she will write a recommendation in advance. She ponders over including a clause allowing Sicarius to smash things with a flower pot if she gets angry at work. She is sure future candidates for the Count's position will probably be her father and brothers anyway. Sicarius is taken aback and asks if the Countess is implying that she is going to dismiss her. Ophelia realizes what she said and denies it. She asks why she would ever dismiss her. Sicarius asks if it is a problem she was assigned here by imperial decree. Ophelia says she does not care where she came from or if she has any other purposes. She doesn't know what might happen to her in the future. Sicarius confesses how she likes this estate, and Ophelia is not bad of a countess either. Ophelia was taken aback by her warm words and thanked her. It is a strange feeling for Ophelia, knowing some people don't dislike her to repair those who are kind to her. She knows she needs to treat them well while she is still alive, and so she will be counting on Sicarius until then. The day of the grand competition soon arrived. Sicarius watches over the husband candidates with her binoculars. Meanwhile, Ophelia dresses up for the occasion, determined to find the right one herself. She is excited and says today marks the start of her journey to find someone to love. Today is the day of the first test in the husband recruitment competition, the swordsmanship tournament. Before the tournament begins, Ophelia has decided to appear in front of the participants to cheer them on. Honestly, she was just too curious and added this to the schedule. After all, she needs to know what her potential husbands look like. There were so many participants in the competition that they couldn't hold the test all at once. Therefore, they split them into groups over several days. After assessing their swordsmanship skills, the tournament would proceed with the scoring system, eliminating anyone below a certain score. Hundreds of participants would be eliminated each day. Ophelia thinks it would be better to rank the successful candidates. By night, Sicarius reports the investigation results of the man Ophelia met the other day. His name was revealed to be Zayn. He was the man who gave Ophelia that strange sense of deja vu. Ophelia also wanted to know about the forest she saw. Unfortunately, there was barely any information on the man until recently. He lived deep in a rural mountain village. When Sicarius investigated, it turns out he appeared there just a year ago. The last clue also points to the previous village he lived in, where one day he suddenly appeared just like the others. He stayed for three years and disappeared without a trace, wandering from place to place, staying like a stranger, then vanishing. No ties, no known background, not even a clear identity. Ophelia could tell the man was suspicious. She asks Sicarius if there are any clues about why he keeps moving. Or is it just wanderlust? Sicarius informs us that both villages mentioned a common reason. The man was searching for remnants of an old forgotten religion, things like abandoned temples or forgotten relics. He searched for anything related to sacred grounds, holy relics, scriptures, and even the descendants of followers. Therefore, the villagers thought of him as a scholar or a researcher. This reminds Ophelia of God. Ever since time rewound, strange connections related to God keep cropping up around her, the emperor, the vanished temple, and now this man named Zayn. Sicarius says that before the man left, he said something peculiar, I have finally found it, right here, in this place. Later, Ophelia wonders what he could have found here and what his real identity is. Her thoughts get interrupted as Cadden approaches her. He officially became the captain of the knights five days ago. Whether it is his previous experience as the Imperial Knight Commander or his naturally intelligent nature, he has already formed a solid group of skilled knights and started rigorous training. 
The more Ophelia sees him, the more impressed she is by his skills. She asked if there was any document he needed urgently approved. Cadden says it's not that, and rather he wanted to escort her to see the participants today. Ophelia is surprised by this and wonders if he thinks because she holds the proof of his family's innocence. He must pledge his loyalty to her. Philia reminds Cadden again that he does not need to pledge his loyalty to her and not worry. Cadden says that's not it, and this is just something he wants to do. Ophelia is taken aback and doesn't argue further. Sicarius soon announces the arrival of the Countess of Frisia, causing a ripple of surprise among the crowd. All eyes turn toward her, and they are taken aback to see the esteemed Imperial Knight Commander Cadden at her side. As Ophelia steps forward, she addresses the audience with a warm yet commanding presence. She assures them that she won't take up too much of their time. She begins by thanking them for coming, her voice resonating with sincerity. The participants are captivated by her grace and charisma, their gazes locked onto her. Ophelia expresses her hopes for a safe competition, wishing that none of them face harm along the way. A genuine smile spreads across her face as she anticipates seeing many familiar faces in the next round. The men in the crowd are utterly enchanted, their hearts racing in admiration of her beauty. Some find themselves clutching their chests. Ophelia is flustered to see so many people who know how to love. This makes her feel happy. At dinner, Ophelia asks about Cadden, but he is not present. She says it was he who suggested dinner. This makes Ophelia feel worried, as Cadden is not the kind of person to miss a meeting. She looks outside the window and sees people rushing around. Cadden soon barges inside and says he has urgent news to report. Ophelia could notice how he had been running hard, and worry was clear on his face. Cadden reveals how there is a strange phenomenon happening on the outskirts of this state. In the air, a pitch black hole has appeared. Cadden reveals it is beyond the garden's forest, near the clearing by the lakeside. Ophelia's eyes widen in realization. That is where the temporary used to be now. She understands that all of this was not a coincidence. The strange sense of unease she has felt until now, and today's bizarre phenomena, maybe they were all because of her. She says she needs to go there immediately. Sicarius warns her it will be dangerous, to which she says she will go with Sir Cadden. As Ophelia makes her way to the black hole, she sees Zane there, standing and watching. She tells him to stop right now and step away. Cadden agrees, telling him it's dangerous near that fissure. Zane smirks and says it is small. He touches it and absorbs the hole away. This shocks Ophelia, Cadden, and Sicarius. She asks who he is. He points to himself, feigning surprise, and says he is just a contestant trying to make a good impression on the Countess. Ophelia is reminded of the night she visited the temple. The pitch black hole engulfed her completely. She regains her senses and finds herself in a forest she has never seen before. However, it feels like she has been here before. Ophelia sees Zane standing ahead. Just then, Ophelia is jolted awake from her dream. Last night, besides the Count's territory, multiple fissures appeared across the city simultaneously. But the strange thing is, the further away from the capital, the fewer fissures appeared. Ophelia thought it was related to her, and she wondered if there was something more at play. Plus, Zane faced the fissures like it was nothing and even erased them easily. He said that these fissures also appeared 300 years ago. He told her that Sidium priests should have records. Ophelia asked how he got rid of the fissures. Zane said that is a secret, but he has a bit of divine power. If such fissures appear again in the territory, he can get rid of them, and as a contestant in the tournament, he tells her to consider this a favor only for the Countess. But he asked her not to tell anyone about him, especially not the priests. Ophelia is not sure what Zane's true intentions are, but for now, she has no choice but to use his abilities. She should draw up a contract to keep him here, but she wonders why he has not still shown up. Sicarius reveals he is currently participating in the tournament. Soon, a judge from the tournament entered the Countess study and revealed that the winner of the swordsmanship tournament had been decided. Sicarius is shocked to see the results and reveals that it is contestant Zane who has a perfect score. The judge reveals how extraordinary his skill is that it is surprising he has not been knighted yet. And after hearing that the Countess was looking for him, he finished all his matches in under a minute each. Just then, Zane approaches the door, asking if they are talking about him. He greets Ophelia, saying he came running because she called. Zane just finished the swordsmanship competition, and yet Ophelia sees he is spotless without a speck of dust. His hair is slightly wet. He said he was trying to impress her and wondered if he would take a bath. Zane expresses how he feels flattered that the Countess is paying such close attention to him. Ophelia wishes he would show more of that special favor he promised. She says she wants him to come by the mansion every day from now on. Zane walks closer and asks if her approach is not a bit forceful. Ophelia says she would like him to keep an eye on the tournament while the tests 
are ongoing in case another fisher appears. She says she is thinking of drafting an employment contract as well. Zane asks if he will get extra points if he tells the truth. He says the truth is he has already put a safeguard in place at the mansion. So, there should not be any fishers inside the mansion. It is unless they are so big he cannot handle them. Ophelia asks if he can cover the entire territory too. Zane says that will be too much for him. She asks if there is any warning before a fissure appears. Zane explains that usually there is a phenomenon where space starts to distort. But sometimes they appear without warning at all. Ophelia asks how he even knows all this. She wonders out loud if he were once a priest of the Sadium Church. And if he has been cast out, Ophelia thinks he doesn't want to tell anyone. Zane chuckles and says he is not a priest. She asks how he has divine power then. Zane says he was a believer in the past. Ophelia notices how he uses the past tense. Does it mean he left the faith on his own, not because he was cast out? Ophelia could tell the man would not give her a straight answer from that expression. That smile, hiding your thoughts and emotions from being read. It is the same expression she used to wear a lot. Ophelia says his identity isn't her concern. For now, he is just a participant in this tournament. Zane says he knows the reason for the fissures happening. In return for telling her, he tells her to grant him a favor. He asks if he can roam around the mansion freely. Ophelia pauses and agrees. That is a cheap price for such valuable information. Zane says it is for cleaning purposes. There is a certain amount of energy in the world. When one type of energy grows larger, the opposite energy diminishes to maintain balance. But when one energy exists in the wrong way, that is when fissures appear. It is when energy that should not exist in the world exists. Ophelia wonders what on earth he is talking about. She wonders if it means these fissures are happening because of her. Is it because she came back to life when she should have died? She scoffs and starts laughing. She now only has a year and one month left to face these fissures that are trying to kill her, the ones who disrupted the balance. However, Ophelia has no plans to die in vain. She thanked Zane for letting her know and shook hands with him. After hearing about the fissures from Zane, Ophelia became even more obsessed with the tournament. She cannot die until she experiences true love and begins watching over the other contestants. She is determined to live the rest of her life on her own terms. She overhears a few men talking about how she is not in her right mind. The others agree, saying hosting a tournament like this shows how unstable she is. A red-haired man suggests that if he marries her, he can sweet-talk her into giving him the lordship. The red-haired man scoffs, saying she is obsessed with men and can be tamed easily. But he does not get to complete his sentence. Sir Cadden looms over them, his complexion dark with rage. He pushes the man and draws his sword. He threatens to behead him, so he will not be able to take the next test. Cadden asks if he really thought he would get away unscathed after spewing such nonsense about the Countess. The men ask for forgiveness, but Cadden mercilessly says they can do that in the afterlife. Cadden soon turns sway, saying it is better to handle this through the proper procedures, and has his knights drag the preparators away. After they leave, Cadden tells Ophelia she can come out now. Ophelia chuckles and asks how he knew she was here. Cadden says, as a knight, one must always keep their senses sharp. He then turns shy and says he smells a lovely fragrance. Ophelia smiles and says she will use a different perfume if she wants to hide from him the next time. She then thanks him for dealing with those men. Cadden tells her not to worry, as he will warn the other contestants as well. Ophelia stares at Cadden, wondering what those complex emotions are she sees in his eyes. In all her life since her return, he was the first person to look at her like that. Suddenly, Ophelia wanted to know what he was feeling. Is it just a pity? If not, then what is it? Ophelia tells him not to worry, as it is not worth wasting her emotions on people like them. She says she is grateful for him, as the crime rate in the county's territory has decreased since he came. Cadden became confused and asked if she wasn't distrustful of him. And isn't that why she said his employment period was one year and two months? Ophelia thought he was pleased since she did not mention the contract duration. She had no idea he thought this way. She wonders if that is why he has been working so hard on the knight's duties and if it was all to earn her trust. She coughs awkwardly and says she misunderstands. She says he did not seem happy to come here, so she thought if he felt that way after the period ended, she would let him go willingly. As they walk, Ophelia discusses how she investigated the oath of a knight. She says she became curious after hearing him mention it. In reality, it was the romantic portrayal of the knight's oath in a play that sparked her curiosity. From what Ophelia found, the knight's oath is recited while kneeling in front of the person they pledge loyalty to, swearing their vow. And finally, they kiss the back of the person's hand. 
As time passed, the oath gained a more romantic touch. It is probably what tugged at the hearts of many ladies. She mentions how in the play, there was a line in the oath that said, Until the moment I close my eyes for the last time, I will protect your safety. Cadden says that is often the kind of vow a knight makes to a lady. Ophelia mentions how admirable knights are making Cadden blush slightly. Ophelia then asks if he ever wanted to protect someone nearby. Cadden says it is his duty as a knight. Ophelia asks if he has ever wanted to make a vow out of personal feelings. Cadden says he does not know. He then asks her if she has ever wanted to receive such a vow. Ophelia disagrees. She cannot rely on a vow to protect her in a world as harsh as this. Besides, she is already someone who does not long for this world. She does not have the desire or the confidence to take responsibility for someone's life. She says she is nonetheless curious about who might be the person Cadden would swear such an emotional, lifelong vow to. With this, the video ends. What does true love mean for Ophelia in a world filled with treachery and suspicion? And can she find it amidst the chaos? What hidden agendas might Zayn have? And why does he seem to know Ophelia? Most importantly, what dark secrets from her past and her husband's treachery continue to unravel, threatening her newfound chance at love? Stay tuned for more.